Hi, everybody. I'm Caroline Lloyd. I'm the co-founder of Muddy Plays, and we have something absolutely amazing, amazing, amazing today. We have singer, songwriter, author, Mary Gaucher. We're so honored. And we have our phenomenal publicist and writer, Laura Rossi. So what's going to happen is I'm going to just give a little introduction to Laura. Laura's going to give an introduction to Mary. All of you out there, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And also, please know you can buy Mary's book, Saved by a Song. We suggest you buy it through bookshop.org because then you're helping to support your local community bookstores, which is important. So, okay, let me introduce Laura first. Laura Rossi is a published author, digital influencer, podcast producer, and public relations expert. For three decades, Laura led book publicity campaigns for best-selling authors at the New York City's top publishing houses, which means Random House, Dell, The Dow Press, Viking Penguin, and W.W. Norton, before founding Laura Rossi Public Relations, a publicity and marketing agency for books, authors, nonprofits, and products. Laura has written or appeared in the New York Times, Psychology Today, The Chronicle of Higher Education, MSN, The Huffington Post, More, Thrive Global, and NPR. Laura produces the national podcast, Parent Footprint with Dr. Dan, for Exactly Right. And I have to tell you, it's a fabulous podcast. And I was so lucky to be on it. Thank you, Laura. Um, she also does the podcast network founded by my favorite murder host, Georgia Hardstack and Karen Key Garth. Sorry if I butchered that name. Okay, Laura has cool. worked with authors including Terry McMillan, Stephen King, Daniel Steele, Elmore Leonard, Mary Alice Monroe, Zibby Owens, John Cleese, Winton Marcellus, John Grisham, Dennis Rodman, and me. And she's the best publicist I've ever had in the whole wide world. Thank Laura you. is also a published author, most recently contributing to Fast Funny Women, a collection, and the forthcoming Fast Fierce Women, both from Woodhall Press. Laura's volunteer projects include public relations for Mighty Blaze and local NPR. She majored in English and communications. Um, and she <laughs> lectures about book publishing, social media, and parenting. Um, Mary Gaucher. I'm just going to give a brief intro, and then Laura's going to take over the intro. The Associated Press named Mary Gaucher one of the best songwriters of her generation. Her album, Rifles and Rosary Beats, was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Folk Album and Record of the Year by the American Music Association. Her songs have been recorded by dozens of great artists, including Boy George, Blake Shelton, Tim McCraw, Betty LeVette, Kathy Matea, Amy Helm, and Candy Stanton. Saved by a Song is her first book. So I'm going to vanish and turn this over to Laura now. Laura, take it away. Thank you, Caroline. I appreciate that long and glowing introduction, and you've been one of my favorite authors to work with. I'm so excited to welcome Mary today, and I'm going to sort of dive in with an intro, and then we'll get right to some questions. Mary Gaucher is a Grammy-nominated American folk singer, songwriter, and author. Her songs have been covered by performers including Tim McGraw, Blake Shelton, and Jimmy Buffett. She has won multiple music awards, and her 2018 album, Rifles and Rosary Beasts, co-written with military veterans and their families has been hailed as a landmark achievement, which I agree. In Saved by a Song, Mary's first book, she pulls the curtain back on the artistry of songwriting and much more. If you love memoir, art, and music, you will love Saved by a Song. I could not put this book down. Um, the book celebrates the redemptive power of music to inspire and bring people together, which is something that Mary does um, with all of her music. Her book has been called a powerful memoir by Kirkus in a starred review, a treasure of a book by Booklist, and a riveting memoir by Library Journal. Among others, Brandy Carlisle, Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls, Emmy Lou Harris, Sarah Silverman, Robert Plant, and Wally Lamb have all praised the book. Welcome, Mary. Good to be with you today. Thank you. So Mary, I know you're in the middle of your virtual book tour um, that the book just came out on July 6th and you've been doing various events. Um, we are thrilled to have you at A Mighty Blaze. We're a literary platform that emerged uh, right when the COVID pandemic hit. 
and we love connecting readers with writers. And today we're doing one of our very first events of connecting readers, writers, and songwriters and music, which is why I'm wearing my music shirt. So let's get to the first question. Mary, you fell in love with books as a kid when the Baton Rouge bookmobile rolled into town. Did you always dream of becoming a published author? And when did you decide to write this book? I know over time it changed um, format. So I'd love to hear a little of the background about how we got to uh, Save by a Song. Thanks for asking. You know, uh, I'm a I'm a book lover. Uh, it started when I was just a little girl, and uh, it it continues. Um, my book, my house is covered in books, wall to wall books, every room, every wall. I I just uh, uh, I collect books and I I read uh, all the time. Um, I don't know if I ever imagined myself an author. Um, I became a songwriter later in life, uh, and that uh, kept me so busy that um, it just didn't seem like I would have the time to write a book. And then I got approached by Yale University Press to write a book for them, and I decided uh, I would make the time. If Yale would put it out, of course I would write a book. And uh, we worked together on a, a book called uh, Why, uh, Why Songs Matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a two-year process that ended with the book not getting published uh, uh, on Yale University Press, at Yale University Press, um, which was disappointing, but um, I'm not sure it was a great match, me and Yale. Um, I quit high school. I quit college. I didn't go to music school. I don't read music. I don't know the technical aspects of songwriting. Uh, and I don't care. Uh, what I care about is is connecting yeah. with people in an honest way that means something to both myself and those who listen. So I probably wasn't a great pair for Yale anyway. And that book went on to uh, uh, sit on the shelf for a little while, and then I was approached by, uh, by St. Martin's Press. Uh, and they wanted that book, but they wanted a memoir as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I rewrote the manuscript and used um, some of the ideas uh, from the Yale book, but mostly uh, what I did was was look at songwriting uh, chapter by chapter using a song uh, and talk about my songwriting process and talk about my life and deepening understanding of the songwriting process and the purpose of the songwriting process. And uh, the book starts with... Um, with me uh, getting arrested for drunk driving uh, in 1990. Uh, right from the first sentence, Barry. <laughs> boom, flashing red lights behind you at night when you're drinking. This is, this is terrifying. And uh, I did spend the night in jail and it changed my, the whole trajectory of my life. Uh, weirdly, my sober anniversary is July 13th, 1990. So yesterday was 31 years sober for me. Yay, not dead, not That's dead. Awesome. So that put me on a completely different path than what I was on when I got sober. I eventually became a songwriter and through the songwriting and teaching songwriting, I got approached by Yale to write a book about it. And then it moved into the major publishing world with with St. Martin's Press. And so it's a book that uh, I didn't foresee myself writing, but if I had uh, you know, someone to back it and put it into the world, I would carve out the time to do it, and, and I did. You did it, you did a, a beautiful job. And that actually takes me uh, to my next question, which is um, I love that you start each chapter with uh, lyrics in Saved by a Song. And I wondered, as I was reading the book and then I reread it again last night, did you decide what lyrics to put first at the chapter and then write the chapter? Or did you write the chapter and then put the lyrics there? You know, they, they, they're so beautifully paired. And I was wondering what that process was like. Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, I think putting a book together is kind of like a Rubik's Cube. Um, it, you, you spin the idea around and around and around and try to find a, a way of telling the story that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. And when I landed on the title Saved by a Song, which I felt that's the title, that's the right title, and St. Martin's uh, Press agreed with me, um, it made just perfect sense to start with my arrest and a song about alcoholism called I Drink. 
So this doesn't go a lot into my childhood except uh, in a flashback way. What, it, what I'm trying to do is start with recovery and then becoming a songwriter. <coughs> Excuse me. Bless you. Um, and then um, using the songs that I wrote uh, as I went along in my life uh, as a roadmap to tell the story of my life uh, and uh, my deepening understanding of songwriting along the way. Okay. So, you know, that, for the people that have not read the book yet, that um, beautiful pairing of the lyrics and, you know, almost all of them are your songs with the exception of a John Prine song and one other that now is slipping my mind. John Lennon, Mother. John Lennon. And, you know, if you love music and you love books, it's you know, this kind of pairing that really draws the reader in. Um, so, Mary, during the pandemic, you know from all of my comments that I joined your Sundays with Mary and Jamie, wherever you are. Hi, Jamie. Um, for your shows. And they were very hopeful. They were very healing. What was it like committing to doing those every Sunday? And you gave us so much during those sessions. Can you just tell us what they gave you. I mean, <laughs> the feed that need to perform or, you know, I just sort of wanted kind of the inside, you know, vision of like what it was like being the one performing for all of us. It really wasn't something that was well thought out. I mean, uh, my partner, Jamie's uh, got friends who are really good at, uh, at technology. Uh, one of them worked uh, for South by Southwest Music Conference in Austin. And they learned really quickly this platform, StreamYard, and how to bring a guest onto the screen. Uh, and uh, they they set this up for me. So uh, a few musicians were doing it. And I, I thought, you know, the way that I would want to do it, instead of playing for 90 minutes, I mean, how many weeks can I play the 90 minutes and not repeat myself? You know, maybe three weeks max. <laughs> we the, don't yeah. the format would be bring friends on and that way I get to see my friends because you know this happened during the pandemic and I wasn't seeing anybody but Jamie so uh, it started with my friend Ben Glover who I wrote a lot of songs with and and then I just started working through my uh th through my Rolodex you know through my my uh sure. My, we got my, to travel with you to Italy. You know, you had musicians from all over the country. But what, you know, on behalf of everyone that attended, and you can still go back and watch them all. Um, it, it was literally one of the anchoring things that got myself and our family, and you know, many people we know through the pandemic, knowing we had Sundays with Mary and Jamie and all of your musician friends. Um, so again, I'm going to continue to segue. This is going like as smoothly as a song. Um, at one of your shows in Rhode Island, which is where I am, you told my son, who has special needs, that music. Music is what feelings sound like. I loved that. That was at Common Fence. We have a couple pictures from you and a signed album I have in the background. I remember that encounter. And uh, you know, what a was, beautiful boy. Thank you. It was such a special moment. And um, I wanted to know just kind of, you know, have you always thought about music as the expression, you know, of feelings and things that we maybe can't put into words? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so. That's where I'm coming from. Um, I never really came at it with a burning desire to write a hit or be a star or uh, or do the the commercial part. Uh, I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be uh, free to speak my mind in my songs and and I wanted to use my songs as an exploration of what was going on emotionally inside of me and and to be honest, um, I came at it with with serious desperation, yeah. uh, and and uh, and the 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 driving force for me uh, still is uh, 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 an, a sense of being overwhelmed by being human, uh, being confused by love, being yeah. being uh, um, wounded by trauma, by 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 the world coming at me faster than I can make sense of it. Um, interactions going south in ways I don't understand, relationships coming together and falling apart faster than, than my mind can, can, can process. And I use this as a kind of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly therapeutic, but it gives me a purpose. And um, this is something that I hang my hat on is this, 
this creative process uh, never lets me down. It's it's always waiting for me when I need it. Wow, that that's profound. That's moving. And um, you know, your songs and this book, which I'm going to hold up again, saved by a song, um, really touches people because you're real, you're vulnerable, you're you're brave. Um, both the book and you know your various songs teach us to get back up after we fall, to deal with our pain, to try again, to be hopeful. And you know this wisdom feels like it comes from deep within you. Um, you talk about some spiritual awakenings in the book and also just you've spoken about that before. Um, and I know you started writing your first songs at 35. You know, is this a place of spirituality, religion, soulfulness, kind of, you know, just, um, it feels like a calling. When I think about you, I think you're kind of called to do this. Yeah. How do you, you know, sort of process that? Because it really does feel like really just big and it's channeling through you. Yeah, yeah, it is bigger than me. Um, I, I think I am called, and uh, uh, what does that mean? Well, I try to talk about that a little bit. It's a calling is never something that screams at you. It it comes as a whisper, and it never jumps in front of you and waves its arms and and puts its hand hands out and says stop. I need your attention. It doesn't work that way. Quieter than that, right? It's it's a, it's a subtle whisper that says, "Go, try to write a song. You are a songwriter. Go write. Go write." And uh, if you don't if you don't want to, um, I'll be back in touch uh, down the line. And I work with a lot of songwriters who don't get started with the art form until they're much later in life. Their kids are grown, they're retired from their job, and this whisper has been in their consciousness their whole life, but but they didn't honor it or answer it until they cleared the deck. And uh, it's never too late to, to write songs. No, it, 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 there is such a thing as it's too late to be a pop star, but that's sure. not what the goal here for me or for for the audience I'm writing to, we just want to express ourselves in a way that's beautiful and have people uh, say the magic words, me too. I feel that way too. We want to connect. And so um, I'm called to connect through music and song and now through being an author. Uh, and uh, it's a good life. Well, you know, we, we, we so appreciate your art in, in all forms. Um, and, you know, I wanted to actually chat a little bit um, about some of your music and also the process of writing. You've, you know, run master classes, you offer um, coaching. But one of the things that, you know, I am just most sort of blown away by um, is your work with songwriting with soldiers. And I had a question about that um, that also relates to what you share in the memoir. I wondered, does your own personal addiction journey and story to recovery, um, it, it gives you a unique point of view for all of the work you've done with songwriting with soldiers. Um, Rifles and Rosary Beads is an album that I feel literally has changed and saved lives. I think of Josh and some of the other soldiers um, you know, that I've read about or seen on your show. Do you think that your own personal war against addiction gave you a unique ability to connect with these soldiers? Because this feels like an album that no one else really could have done. Um, I think of one of my favorite songs, uh, Still on the Ride. And I just think that connection with Josh, how you talked about you know, the tears that you've shed over the joy of knowing him, of the love you guys share, of the miracle he is, you know, surprising you with walking again. Um, I, I feel like, I don't know if anyone else could have done that, Mary, you know, because you, you've you gone through your own war. Um, what do you I don't know. I mean, I, I, I feel like all of the songwriters that participate in the Songwriting with Soldiers program uh, bring a level of skill to this work that, that helps their veteran co-writer uh, in, in profound ways because what we do is is help them articulate what's really hard to say. And that's what songs are for. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's unique about me is that I came at it having used songs and songwriting and music uh, to work through my own trauma. 
And uh, uh, I didn't even know I had trauma, but the music and song brought me to the front door of the uh, of the orphanage, uh, uh, St. Vincent de Paul's in New Orleans, Louisiana, where where uh, I was adopted. Uh, I spent a year, my first year of life in that place, and I didn't know that that was traumatizing. I didn't, I didn't know what was underneath my addiction, uh, but music and song helped me to make sense of it. It drove me to make sense of it. I had to make mm-hmm. sense of it. And so I went back to that place for the first time, and uh, uh, I wrote about it, and, and I know... Uh, and I knew going into the work with the veterans uh, that uh, that going to the pain is is probably how to get through the pain. And so I'm not afraid. Uh, it doesn't scare me to gently walk them to the thing that hurts because I know that we can take some pressure off of it by singing about it. Yeah, and that, that, that connection. Um, you know, kind of transcends all types of conversation and connection. Um, staying on on that same topic and that same song, um, and then I'll dive into a few more book questions. So I mentioned Still on the Ride, which is the the weekly request I would put in the comments on Sundays with Mary. Jamie would say, we see you more, we can't do it every week. But it's so uplifting to me. Um, and I wanted to tell you today that, you know, our special needs son, who you met, is is how I discovered and fell in love with your music. He discovered you first um, wow. as a 14 year old or 12 year old. I can't remember the exact age. Um, and so, you know, when I saw in the book that the last chapter of Saved by a Song is those lyrics and the word triumph, um, I wanted to just tell you today that, you know, I feel personally that it's one of the greatest examples of your musical gifts because you sing it from this deep place in your soul that it transcends kind of the literal meaning of the song and sort of goes inside of me as a mom and a special needs mom, as a parent and a woman, to be able to connect to that experience and a soldier's experience. Um, and, you know, the idea of still being on the ride and having guardian angels is something that's personally helped me through kind of the journey um, with our son being a mom of twins and, you know, dealing with our own version of our adversity. And so I wanted to thank you for that. And also, um, if it feels like a natural thing, do you have the ability to play a little bit of it? Sure, I can give that a go. Um, the interesting thing is that the soldiers' stories um, are are uh, are universal. Uh, we're civilians; we haven't been in the military, and we yet can we can really relate to what they're telling us. Um, and uh, they're an extreme. Uh, but we've been there in our own way. Uh, and uh, that helps them to know that, and it helps us to understand them. And so I'll play a little bit of this song I wrote with, uh, with Josh, if I can get it together here.
I will never forget this. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that song for me is kind of the song that saved me over and over. So um, without you know, totally derailing this and making it all about me, I, I wanted to um, pivot and ask you a couple more questions just about uh, writing songs and books. For you, is it is it harder to write words or lyrics? It's hard to write. Uh, no matter how you cut it, it's hard to write. It's hard to write well. Uh, it involves a a real commitment to truth and and a real uh, time uh, uh, commitment. Uh, you've got to put uh, a lot of effort and energy into it. And uh, writing a book is real different than writing a song. Uh, both of them have their own uh, unique challenges. Um, I think that, that for me, uh, there really is no comparison. Long form writing, uh, is real different, uh, involves a whole lot more typing, uh, than, <laughs> uh, writing a song, which is about pairing emotion with melody. Uh, the, the simplicity of the lyrics combined with the, um, the righteous melody that is, uh, the sort of methodology of, telling the listener how to feel and making them feel it. Yeah. Um, melody is really powerful. Uh, uh, it, it, it brings emotion. And if the words of a song match the melody and bring the same emotion, you've got powerful, powerful stuff going on there. And in books, I think it's done through a longer form of, of use of language and, and ability to tell a story well. So um, what's, what is your songwriting process like? You talk a little bit about that in the book, but you know, I, I think sometimes it sounds like it comes to you and it's pouring out of you. Other times are you kind of setting aside time, almost like office time to just yeah. sort of with the guitar and um, just make music? Yeah, mostly it's, it's work. I, I don't have much that pours out of me. I'm not that kind <laughs> of songwriter. I right. sit right here in this chair at this desk and I work. And uh, um, I uh, um, just treat it with respect and give it the time it takes to get it right. And uh, to be honest with you, as I get older, it gets m m much less uh, urgent. Uh, I don't feel this need to prove myself or make a record every two years, or I don't push myself nearly as hard. Um, and I think that's um, interesting to experience that firsthand. I've always wondered why, as artists get older, they, their production uh, uh, starts to slow down a little. I think that's natural. Um, I think the, uh, the drive to do it uh, takes so much energy uh, and is such a commitment. I think um, that, that it, 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 it wears down over time, and I think... I think that I'll continue to make records forever, but I, I won't make them as fast. Uh, and that's all right. You, you know, know I, a different pace, a slightly different pace. Well, you, you know, know, I don't, I don't drive as fast either. I'm, I'm much more likely to be, to Neither be in the, I. We're, we're in the slow lane. Part, so. I'm in the slow lane now. It's and okay. uh, I, I, I say that about myself sometimes too. I'm mostly in the fast lane still, but occasionally, you know, I'm going into the slow lane or the middle lane. Um, before we get to our last few questions and then we take some from the audience, um, at the end of the book, you talk about empathy and changing you know, hearts and minds. And uh, I just wanted you to kind of speak on that a little bit in sort of the last chapter of the book um, and where you, you talk about kind of opening hearts by connecting us as humans. I think that's what art is for, I think. Great art generates empathy, and a great song is empathy. Uh, and uh, empathy is the experience of, uh, of feeling someone else's emotions. It's not feeling bad for someone. It's actually feeling the emotion of, of another person. And that puts you in their shoes solidly, soundly, and really. Yeah. Um, and I think empathy... Uh, is the great, great power of songs and songwriting. And so if you can get a song that generates empathy, um, you can work uh, with someone's uh, uh, beliefs in that, in that arena. 
you, you get you get connected to their heart and then their heart has a little talk with their mind yes. you know i can't get you to to understand about war and what it does to our soldiers by preaching political ideology at you what I, what I do is, is try to create empathy with the song so you can understand what they're going through. And then you can make your decisions and, and build your beliefs around that empathy. So the heart is first, then the heart talks to the mind, and if the mind changes, uh, you've got someone who's being changed. And then if enough people with enough hearts and minds start to change, that's how you change the world. It's done through empathy, though. It's not done any other way in the arts. I agree. And, and that's, you know, one of the things I think that threads through all of your music and that I felt on every page of the book. Um, and I know for all of our folks listening today, um, they may want to ask a few questions. Um, a couple things that, you know, I had written down or just... Um, what authors do you love? What are you reading now? And then I think we have other questions that are going to come in from the queue. Um, I just took in Brandy's book. That was great. Brandy Carlisle wrote a great book. Um, I didn't know that. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I'm going to add that to my to read list. Oh, yeah. Real good book there. Um, what am I reading? I don't know. I got three books going on over there. Um, <laughs> I love it. I, I'm... You probably don't have a lot of time to be reading right now, Mary, since you're talking about your book. I read it. Books. Yeah, I read at night, like most people. Either listen to the, listen to the book as they drive or read it at night. I'm a night reader, and uh, I uh, I tend to uh, to read pretty quickly. Uh, read a couple of chapters a night, and then then I go to bed. That's that's my ritual. I love it. Me too. I do the same thing. Um, Mary, what advice would you give to either an aspiring author or an aspiring songwriter that's tuning in today? Well, I think the trick to this whole thing is perseverance. It's, uh, it's a perseverance game. Perseverance beats talent, hands down. Don't quit. You get better the more you do it. Very cool. Very cool. So um, I don't know, Caroline, is Caroline coming back on or is Trisha going to feed us some questions? I'm asking our Mighty Brains tech team, does Mary have any new projects in the work? Ask him, you shall receive, here come some questions. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll be putting some new music in the world soon enough. I've got a bunch of new songs. I got to get to the studio with them in December, I guess. So it'll be a little bit, but yeah, I'm always working on new stuff. Uh, that's what I do, uh, create, and then I, I put it out in the world. So, um, it's probably be 22. I'll have a new record out. Okay, we look forward to it. Let's see. Does Mary have a favorite song or album that she's created? Not really. I I'm proud of my work. Every single record I've made is the very best I could do at the time. Um, there's. Uh, uh, no ugly children. You love you love all your children. <laughs> Democracy. Everyone Absolutely. I love it. That's great. Okay. Let's see. That's our same question. I have a few other questions too that I've gathered. Um, let's see. Your biggest musical influences, Mary. I don't know. How do you even answer that, right? Yeah. <laughs> all of the above, all of them. <laughs> I like great songwriters. All right, that's fair. That's a very good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, oh, book cover. Well, you have the poster. I have the actual book here. Um, this is Mary's guitar. And then you have something behind you, right? This <laughs> The same guitar. Yeah, I love the cover art of the book. It's so cool. Yeah, thanks. We shot that downstairs in Jamie's office with the iPhone. Really? Oh, that's great. Simple, well done work. Click done. <laughs> that's amazing. Wow, yeah. good job, yeah. Jamie. Yeah. Um, before we end, and I might ask you to play one more song. I just want to say that um, 
your new fans from today's show that are all going to go out and buy this book immediately and buy it as a gift. If you like art, if you like music, if you like books, you need to support Mary. Um, they may not all know the story behind one of your most beloved and requested songs, Mercy Now. You actually closed out most of your Sunday shows, um, Sundays with Mary, with the song. Your raw and moving description of writing that song in the book touches universal themes of pain and loss. When you play that song, Mary, does it bring you back to the moment of when you wrote it or the moments that went into writing it? You know, because you play it so often, I was wondering what that experience was like, um, playing a song that is you know, continually being asked for and that we might enjoy uh, you kind of taking us out with today. I was hoping Jamie was there to join you, but um, she's probably doing her Jamie stuff. So I'd love- Yes, yeah, she's out on the road. She's Today's Woody Guthrie's birthday. She's playing- Oh, cool. Woody Guthrie Jamie Harris. Everyone Festival. check out Jamie Harris. Um, mm. I don't know her website, but we can put it up in the comments later. It's Jamie is um, an artist that I've discovered through the Sundays with Mary um, shows. She's incredible. She's Mary's partner. Um, she she's and I are great. Yeah. And she's amazingly talented with the two of you together, you know, kind of the harmony stuff. And when you play Mercy now and kind of the different nuances of how you played it every week. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's great. Um, we did have one fight on the Sunday with Mary's. No. Oh, breaking news! <laughs> was it over the technology, or was it? Um, no, it was. She was reading comments, and I was trying to express some heartfelt oh, soliloquy. And she's reading comments, and she burst into <laughs> laughter. I'm like, what the hell's so funny right now? I got really mad at mad as a hornet, and she's like, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm I like, can't remember that. There's so many. I am you. here telling you my heart, and you're over there laughing. It was, it was a moment. Yes. It was, it was no, very, it was very a real. It was when real. You do, well, like, yeah, when you do a show for uh, every Sunday for 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 uh, what for thir thirteen? I mean, eighteen months, nineteen. I eighteen, know, nineteen I months. Term. Yeah, there's 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 moments where, where where things can get just you forget the cameras on and you're just in your room and it's just like, oh man, yeah. Um, but we dig fine. We got through it and and uh, um, but Mary, yeah. see one more question before we get ready to close out. Um, someone's asking about your TED talk, what that was like and how sort of that came about. It's really hard. TED talks really hard. It's close as I ever want to get to the military. It's wow. very, very really? structured, very, very rehearsed. Uh, they have a team of people who work with you for months, um, and it's very wow. competitive. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to hit each segment of the talk has to hit a certain time wow. limit. Uh, and uh, it is not easy. And I watched grown men burst into tears when they <laughs> forgot their lines. It's memorized in some ways. Okay. Uh, I had an unfair advantage because I'm used to being on stage, and uh, uh, if 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 it were memorized, I would fail. So I didn't memorize it. I just knew it. Uh, yes. The people who memorized it found it really really hard. Um, but TED talks are are much more difficult than they look. What what Brene Brown did with hers is kind of amazing. She's amazing. Well, she's a teacher. She's used to being in front of an audience, a class, an audience. Right. And so she, she Very just addresses them as the students. Um, the, the, the people who give the best TED Talks are usually teachers or, or people in front of audiences all the time. Interesting yeah, but it's hard, hard, hard. And um, whew. Well, you did, did it. You did a great job. You know, I, I keep going back, you know, when I hear you talk about that, it just reminds me of talking about your own kind of stage fright and being so nervous getting up for those open mic nights. I, I had a question I didn't ask you about, but... Um, at club uh is it paseum is that how you say the name yeah Cambridge? just you know you were terrified to kind of get up there and do your thing and at 35 you know going to these open mic nights and yeah. and now um it seems like you've just you know kind of overcome all of that and you you shine on camera on stage and everywhere else so yeah the yeah time. yeah i mean in the beginning you got to work through the fear if yeah. you're starting something new at 35 you gotta you gotta you gotta humble yourself and 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 um be at the beginning and yeah. that 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 that's what i was writing about is 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 the uh the feeling of being up there at the beginning so really? 
I, I felt a little of that coming into today's talk just because, you know, you're such an icon um, as a musician and you're a human I admire so deeply. And so oh, I'm thanks, really Laura. behind the scenes, Mary, doing the publicity work, not normally in front of the camera. This is my first hosting for a Mighty Blaze. And you're doing great. Thank you. I love oh, hearing yeah. that. I, I, you know, sort of wanted to challenge myself to be able to do this and it's been incredible and you know i know you have other events coming up so it's i'm going to leave it up to you and our audience you know we can end now if you want to close us out with a tiny bit of mercy now like you do on sundays with mary uh we would love it and it. um just bought tickets to your show in the boston area for the fall so i will be seeing you yeah. in the third row with our son and um my husband so oh we'll come say hi we definitely will. We need a new picture. Yes, update that thing. Congratulations on your book. Everyone buy it. It needs to be a bestseller. And Mary Gaucher is a gem, a rare and beautiful human. Um, and I'm just so lucky to know you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. You did a great job today. Thanks for getting me in here. Thanks for being a Thank supporter you. of the arts. And uh, hug that boy for me. He's beautiful. See you soon, Mary. My father sure could use a little mercy now The fruits of his labor fall and rot slowly on the ground His work is almost over won't be long, he won't be around I love my father He could use some mercy now And my brother Sure could use a little mercy now He's a stranger to freedom Shackled to his fear and doubt The pain that he lives in It's almost more than living will allow Country, they could use a little mercy now. As they sink into a poison pit, it's gonna take forever to climb out. They carry the weight of the faithful. Follow them down I love my church and country They could use some mercy now Every living thing could use a little mercy now Another mushroom cloud. There's people in power who'll do anything to keep their crown. I love life, life itself. Could you? Now. Yeah, we are. We 
y'all could use a little mercy now. I know we don't deserve it, but we need it anyhow. We hang in the balance, we dangle between hell and hallowed ground. And every single Yes, every single one of us could use some mercy Thank you from the bottom of my heart, Mary, and for everyone in the Mighty Blaze. It's been such a privilege and honor to have you here, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Laura. We'll see y'all. Bye.